Jeremiah chapter number 2. Of course, those of you that know me and know me well know that Jeremiah is uh, my book. I love the book of Jeremiah. Uh, I fear a lot of times when God leads me there, uh, a lot of hard things in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, but probably one of my favorite passages out of Jeremiah we'll read tonight. Chapter number 2, we we'll begin reading verse number 12. The Bible says, Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate, saith the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the good singing. Our hearts were stirred. Uh, Lord, the very remembrance that, Lord, sometimes in the valley we find the sweetest fellowship with you. Lord, realizing that you choose the base things to confound the wise, that little as much when you're in it and God thank you for the good testimonies thank you for hearing and answering prayer and thank you for being a good God thank you for these thy people thank you for all that gets done through our church the missionaries that are supported the gospel that goes out the families that are helped Lord those that attend the services and God draw closer to thee those that are used of thee on their jobs and in their neighborhoods and communities and amongst their family. God, uh, we realize that the sun never sets on the ministry of Emmanuel Baptist Church. And God, we're eternally grateful and we don't even begin to know all that you do through our church. Lord, we have a desire and a hope for true revival. And God, I pray that, Lord, you'd begin to stir our hearts and you begin to work in our lives that we'll be conditioned, primed, and ready when the meeting does come. And God, we'd be all in, and God, we would see true revival break out in this place in these days. God, other churches are endeavoring to have revival. Brother Amos is going on this week and others. And God, I pray you'd bless these churches as well. Now, God, I pray you'd use this unworthy vessel, bring under my remembrance those things I've been faithful to study. God, help your people, enlighten our minds, prick our hearts, draw us closer to thee. And God, we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful and glorious name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to draw your attention to a very somber verse. In verse number 12, we find that God calls for the heavens, or if you will, the heavenly host, to pay attention to something. He calls for the heavens, first of all, to be astonished. He says, be astonished, O ye heavens. Be amazed. Stand in awe. I don't know about you, but those that are already in glory... Those that have already been in the abode of God and in the presence of God, uh, those that uh, have heard the thundering voice of God and seen the handiwork of God, uh, I uh, think that it would be a, a, a very stretch of imagination for them to be astonished at anything anymore. Can you think about that? I mean, everything that we aspire and long for, they already have. They've already seen the Lord in His glory. And when God looks at them and says, Be astonished, they're thinking, At what? He says, Be astonished. He also tells them to be afraid. I don't know about you, but when I think of heaven, I don't think of fear. When I think of being in the literal presence of God, fear is the last thing that would be on my mind. But here He tells... 
all the heavens to be astonished. And he says, and be horribly afraid. Uh, if he didn't get their attention with being astonished, he now has their attention with saying, be afraid. Horribly afraid. But then we find that he also tells them to become very afflicted. Look what he says. Uh, be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. That word desolate means to be afflicted. Now again, when I think of those before and in the presence of God, uh, there are no more afflictions. Matter of fact, we know that uh, in Revelation chapter number 21, 22 lets us know that God's going to wipe away all the tears from our eyes. Uh, there'll be no more pain. There'll be more, more suffering. Uh, when we think of heaven, we don't think of suffering and affliction. Uh, we think of deliverance. But he says, be very desolate. Be afflicted. Why? Why would God call the heavens to this attention? We find in verse 13. He says, for my people have committed two evils. Now notice he didn't say for the heathen of the world. Notice he didn't say for the unbelievers. Notice he didn't say for the religious crowd. He said, my people have committed two evils. And because of this, be astonished. Now listen, it's one thing to hear of wicked people doing heinous things. But we don't think about God's people doing heinous things. God says, be astonished. He says, be horribly afraid that my people have committed two evils. Be ye very desolate or afflicted because my people have committed two evils. He, he is saying to be astonished and afraid and afflicted because of his people's actions. What were their actions? He says, They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. He said, They have forsaken the fountain, and they have forged failing ways. Why in the world would we forsake the fountain of living waters for something that cannot hold water? Now, Unless it's changed, I, I believe Brother Brian and Miss Veronica, they have a sister. Now, wouldn't it be terrible if you knocked a hole in your cistern and you kept having Brother Jack bring you some water and it didn't hold the water? Every day you're having to fill it up and it's of no use. It's no value. Uh, it's a waste of time. And God is saying when we have forsaken him, uh, the fountain of living waters, for anything else, it's of no benefit. Uh, it's useless. Uh, it's a waste of time. Uh, and we should wake up to that fact. But yet, many of God's people just keep trying to pour water into something that doesn't hold water. Something that is the work of their own hands rather than the work of the Master's hand. And with God's help, I want to preach on this little thought tonight. I want to preach on why so many Christians are powerless. Why so many Christians are powerless. Now listen. We used to, and Brother Clint, he'll remember this, used to, we'd sing the, the song, We've Got the Power. And they, we used to sing, we got the power, power, power. Remember that? Huh? We don't sing that song anymore. We don't want to lie in church. How come we don't have the power of God on us anymore? How come so many of God's people can pray and nothing happens? Can come to church and there is no change? Can read the Bible and get nothing out of it? Huh? can stand in adversity and fall and crumble before the enemy. How come they have no power to overcome? No power to scare off the enemy. No power to have God shut the heavens up and move on their behalf. How come we have no power? We've forsaken the fountain of living waters. And we're hanging out with broken cisterns. 
we're trusting in failing things. We have no power because of there's a, a failure to acknowledge the need for repentance. Most God's people come to church and we think we're okay. We haven't, you know, horn cussed anybody today and we haven't uh, 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 slipped and said any four letter words and uh, uh, we did come to church so we must be doing okay. But we fail to acknowledge the need for repentance. Every day we don't have the power of God, we need to repent. Mm -hmm. But see, we don't acknowledge that. See, we bought into so much of this uh, shallow preaching today where most people have to come to church and hear a message that makes them feel better about themselves, uh, feel better about their miserable life, uh, feel better about their miserable job, uh, feel better about uh, uh, the price of gas, and feel better about everything, uh, and they've got to come and get their ears tickled, uh, and they've got to come and hear how much Jesus loves them and how good they are uh, and how wonderful they are and how wonderful it is for you to come uh, uh, that we don't do business with Almighty God. And by failing to acknowledge the need for repentance, we've hewed out broken cisterns. You don't hear messages on repentance much anymore. They're not real popular. Preachers don't keep their jobs preaching. People don't want to hear it. Repentance, my dear friends, is turning from the direction we're going, turning back to God. And if we've got broken cisterns, we need God. Why would we want something broken when we can have the fountain of living waters? Uh, too many of God's people come seeking His blessing instead of coming seeking Him. We need to repent. Tell God we're sorry and that we spent so much time hanging out with broken things instead of trusting His hand. And I say... We're trusting in failing things. So many Christians are powerless because the, there's a failure in abandonment to the all-sufficient God. Abandonment means you forsake everything that the world has to offer and you just surrender everything to God. But we don't abandon to God. We abandon to the news media. We abandon to the banker man. We abandon to our job. It, it ab absolutely blows our mind. We will not miss our job, but we'll miss church. Who do you think God thinks is more important to you? Your job, your boss man, or him? Who do you think gave you your job? Who do you think gave you the strength to get out of bed so you can go to your job? But yet, we put more stock in all kinds of things than we do Almighty God. We haven't abandoned ourselves to God. We do not cry out, sirs, we would see Jesus. We do not live our lives in the light of what pleases God. We live our lives in, in, in light of what pleases us, and then God fits in wherever he fits in. And it's a broken sister. There's a reason there is no revival. There's a reason folks don't have any power with God. They haven't abandoned themselves to him. There's a failure in the application of rightly dividing the scriptures. Do you know that you will be judged by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? Knowing that, shouldn't you make certain you know what it says? Shouldn't you make sure that your life lives up to what thus saith the Lord? And yet... We hit and miss at the Word of God. We don't study it. We don't rightly divide it. We'll listen to what every Tom Dick, Harry believes. And we just go through life. You need to apply the Word of God to your life and let your life change according to the Word of God. When was the last time that you came to church and whatever was preached impacted you so much that it changed you? I was telling Miss Lim for service just a couple weeks ago. Brother Sidney was here. That was some of the finest preaching you'll ever hear. I don't know that I've ever heard him any better. And I've heard him preach hundreds of times. 
And yet I wonder how it impacted us. Did we apply it? Did it change us? Are we wowed at the things of God? That's why we're powerless. We got broken cisterns. It's all about our agenda and not the Lord's. We're powerless because there's a failure to access the throne room in spirit-led prayer. When was the last time you entered the, your prayer closet and you were led of the Spirit in your prayer? Let me just ask you this. When was the last time your prayer life was anything short of a shopping list you asking God for things? Spirit-led prayer doesn't ask God for anything. Spirit-led prayer glorifies God in your prayer. When was the last time you got to the point in your prayer life you ran out of words? And the Holy Ghost through utterance and groanings took your heart to Almighty God. Power comes through prayer. Spirit-led prayer. And the reason so many of God's people are powerless is because the first place we'll shortchange in our Christian life is our prayer life. It amazes me we got time for everything but to pray. Y'all get mad at me and that's okay. When we get to heaven, you're going to find out how much of this cost you the power of God. You got more power with Verizon than you do Almighty God because you're more invested with them. That's popular preaching. Thought you wanted revival. Thought you wanted to see God change your loved ones' lives and change your community. Well, that'll happen when you let God change you. Christians are powerless because we fail to alienate ourselves from worldliness. See, there was a time when the world knew the difference between Christians and non-Christians. Now it's kind of hard to tell the difference. Matter of fact, used to, if you went to a restaurant on Sunday, you could tell the folks that had been to church and the ones that hadn't. Now you're hard-pressed. Matter of fact, most of the time, if you're wearing a suit coat, they think you come from a funeral. And from most church services, that's what they did come from. But we've not alienated ourselves or separated ourselves from the worldliness. So many people come into the house of God with the world hanging on them. We wonder where is the Lord. Well, God does not sanction worldliness. He says, be a separate people and I'll be your father. Come out from among them, be a separate, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. We haven't alienated ourselves from the world's pleasures. So many things that the world finds wonderful, Christians are partaking of. Mm -hmm. Worldliness. Let me just say this, there is pleasure in sin for a season. We haven't alienated ourselves from the world's philosophies. Matter of fact, the world's philosophies has filtered into our churches. There are things that are spoken from behind pulpits that are not biblical, but people embrace them and believe them to be biblical. Can I give you an example? Raise your hand. This is a participation question. This is not me to catch you in something. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this phrase, let go and let God. You ever heard that phrase? You know that's not biblical? What are you supposed to let go of? Now the connotation is, well, let go of your doubt and God, you know, let God have your faith or let go of your, your burden and let God have it and all this. But really... What do you have a hold of? 
anyway that you can let go of? Air? You want to know where that phrase came from? Came from Keswick, England. In the late 19th century, there was one of the very first evangelical meetings where all kinds of people from different religions came together, and that's where that philosophy came from. It's not from your Bible. Show me chapter and verse where it says, let go and let God. Hmm? There's a whole lot in there about putting your faith in God. There's a whole lot in there about trusting God. There's a whole lot in there about loving God with your whole body, soul, and spirit. There's a whole lot in there about turning from the world uh, and trusting in God, but there's not anything in there that... What can you let go of? You're not in control of anything in your life. You don't even know which way is up most times. What can you really let go of and let God have? He has it all anyway. He's God. Hmm? But it's a phrase that makes people feel better. Well, I can just let go of this and let God have it. He's already got it. Why don't you just trust Him to deliver you and whatever's bogging you down? But see, those kind of worldly philosophies have filtered into our churches. And people are trusting in things that God didn't sanction or author. And that's why we're powerless. So we're not trusting in God's Word. We haven't alienated ourselves from worldly practices. The world's philosophy is if it feels good, do it. What's filtered into Christians' lives? Well, my life is so meaningless and it's so aimless that I'm going to just do this. I've missed out on so much, I'm going to do this. And you're powerless because of your mindset. Can I say in being saved, I've not missed out on anything. All I've ever done is gain. But worldly practices have taken hold into churches. So many churches have went with chairs in their sanctuary so they can move them out and have all kinds of activities that aren't worship. The sanctuary is just that. A place where you worship Almighty God. But we have all kinds of multi-purpose buildings and multi-purpose ministries and multi-purpose and we have adopted the philosophies of the world into our churches there's not a day goes by I don't get some kind of mail where the world tries to tell us how to grow our church you know what the big thing is now because of COVID everybody's staying away so you have to have online giving where everybody can give their donations online to your church. And if you're not doing that, you're, you're, you're so far behind the times. There's only one problem with that. The Bible says upon the first day of the week, there's a collection of the saints in the house of God. That's how we take up our offerings. By the way, that's why we don't take up an offering on Wednesday unless we take up something special for somebody. Because the Bible says upon the first day of the week. Hmm? Huh? I mean, are we going to do things by the Bible? Or are we going to do what the world says? Hmm? I've, I've had people ask, Preacher, when are you going to start taking credit cards? Nah. They want the points, Josh, is what they want. First guy that asked me that, he, he bought cars off his GM points from his GM card, and he was wanting to give his tithes uh, with the credit card. You do realize that credit card companies charge businesses Two percent, American Express four percent. So instead of getting ten percent, we'd only get eight or six percent. So the church would be losing taking credit cards. Not to mention we'd become part of the Antichrist system. Huh? <coughs> but that's what they want you to do. And churches are doing it everywhere. And Christians have no idea. The whole time they're doing this, they're disgracing God. 
Christians have become powerless because they haven't alienated themselves from worldliness. Christians are powerless because they fail to actively seek God. How much have you sought God this week? I mean, sought Him. Look for Him. Got real quiet right there. Most people spend more time looking on the TV guide than they do looking for God. Hmm. Try to actively seek Him in adoration. How many times have you told Him this week you love Him? How many times have you stopped this week and just threw up hands toward heaven and said, Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Did you actively seek God in the assembly tonight? That's why we're here, to worship Him. Did you come looking for Him? Hmm? Miss Bella was waiting for me to come out of my office. I knew she was up to something. She was dressed all pretty. She said, I got this song ready. I said, well, get her ready. Yep. I think she came ready. Seeking the Lord. Did you? As soon as she told me she had a song, I thought, we might get in something tonight. And they fail to seek him by adoring him, fail to seek him in the assembly. And so many are powerless because they fail to actively seek him in the administration of their own personal lives. How many decisions did you make this week without consulting him? Say, preacher, I know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Do you know Him as Lord? Because if you know Him as Lord, you don't make the decisions. You let Him make them for you. Lord, I have these two opportunities. Do you want me to take either one, or do you want me to deny them both? What do you want, Lord? Say, preacher, do you, do you know people that really do? I try to do that. I learned a long time ago when I make decisions, it's always a mess. <clears throat> but I also learned this he never fails so I wonder did you actively seek him this week how much in your daily life do you seek him I hear people say pray for me I'm trying to get a job that's a wonderful thing you ought to pray. Lord, do you, want, do you want me to have this job? Or do you want me to stay where I'm at? I wonder if we prayed about our government as much as we complain about our government, if our government might change. You know, the Bible does tell us to pray for them. They have the authority over us. I thought about this. Christians are so... Powerless. Now listen to what I'm about to say. Because they fail to admit using self-worth as an excuse for not being Christ-like. Let me qualify this. There's nobody worthy of the shed blood of Calvary. None of us are worthy of God's attention. None of us are worthy of His love. None of us are worthy of God giving us the time of day. We're not worthy of anything from God. But because He does love us, He went to Calvary and died for us. Uh, and uh, when you did call upon Him, He did save you according to His Word. Uh, he said He would if you called on Him. Uh, he saved you. He changed your life, uh, uh, my dear friends. And because He saved you, uh, He sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, and you are no longer a sinner. 
You're a child of God. But so many of God's people walk around saying, I'm not worthy. And they use that as an excuse not to be Christ-like. He never comes and says, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. Don't feed me. Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. Don't talk to me today. Dad, I'm not worthy. But you don't come and help me today. No, never one time has he ever said, Dad, I'm not worthy. Now, he has said, Dad, what do you got to eat? Dad, can you come over and help? Dad, can you do this? And you know what? I'll break my neck to be able to feed him and help him and do because he's my son. But yet we walk around and say, I, I just ain't worthy uh, because I'm so sorry and I'm so no good and I'm so nothing. And we use that as an excuse to stay sorry and no good rather than to be Christ-like. We're not worthy of what He done for us, but because of what He done for us, we ought to aspire to be like Him. We ought to aspire to be holy. We ought to aspire to have the power of God in our lives. We ought to aspire to be different. We ought to aspire to let folks know that something's happened in our lives. And His name is Jesus. But so many use the excuse that they're not worthy so they can live a worthless life to God. God help us to appreciate in our lowest state He came to us and He heard us and He saved us and He changed us and then He told us be ye holy for I am holy. He didn't say hope you get to be holy or aspire to be holy he says be ye holy in other words you can be holy by depending on him and not yourself so many Christians are powerless because we've forsaken the fountain of living waters and we're trusting in broken ideologies and broken philosophies and broken excuses and broken things that God is displeased with. You want to see revival? Don't forsake the fountain of living waters. Run to it. Jump in it. Embrace it. Let Him truly be the Lord of your life. Bask in the fountain of living water. Do you ever see a bird in a, in a little bird bath, flip all around, get all wet and enjoy it, have a good time. You know what the bird's doing? He's thanking God that there's a bird bath there with some water in it, and he's enjoying it. That's what we ought to do. We ought to just hang around the fountain and enjoy it. And thank God for the fountain and enjoy the, the, freshing, the refreshing and the blessings uh, 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 from the heat of the day because of the fountain that's been provided for us. Friends, we have living water from him we have living water bubbles up within us why in the world would we look towards something that's broken so many people still think it's all about them instead of all about him when it becomes all about him business in every facet of your life picks up God help us Run to the fountain of living water and let Him refresh us and revive us, change us for His glory. Because nothing else will work, friend. I don't want Him to look to the heavenly host on my account and say, Be astonished. Be horribly afraid. Be very desolate because he forsook me I don't want to forsake him I want to embrace him revival starts picking up where we left him getting back to the fountain of living waters let's all stand brother Clint come and get a song God spoke to your heart the altar's open
Friends, we ought to not settle for anything less than having power with God. Nothing else will work. While he's getting ready to pick out a song, let's pray. Father, we love you. Forgive us where we have forsaken you. God, when we have leaned on our understanding instead of yours, when we've trusted in our ways instead of your ways, when we have not wished that the power of God has left us, and we've continued on in our own strength, God, help us yield ourselves unto thee. Help us to truly bask around the fountain of living water. O oh God, Help us to be refreshed and revived. God, do a great work in your people that, Lord, the world might see the greatness of God in them. Blessing this invitation. Help these folks in the altar. God, speak to hearts. Glorify your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.